Report Finance here at Zacks. I'm your host, Ben Rains, and today we're diving into some stocks to help you weather the trade war storm. But before we get into all of that, I want to say remember if you have any questions or episode suggestions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zacks.com. Also, make sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. All right, so getting into it. If anyone was paying attention last Friday, it was a crazy day in the markets. Uh, we had all three major U.S. indexes opening higher, and then they dipped slightly after Fed Chairman Jerome Powell spoke in the morning in a highly anticipated speech from Jackson Hole. Powell didn't give exactly what Wall Street might have hoped. Uh, he said that the central bank was prepared to provide more stimulus via rate cuts if the global economic pullback ends up really negatively impacting the U.S. economy. And his speech came just a few days after President Trump called for the Fed in several tweets to cut its benchmark interest rate by a full percentage point. And this has already come after the Fed cut last month for the first time since the financial crisis to between 2 and 2.25%. And so I want to read you just a, a small part of what Powell said. Uh, the basic premise was that there are limits to what monetary policy can do to stimulate the U.S. economy. So this is the start of the quote. There are, however, no recent precedents to guide any policy response to the current situation. Moreover, while monetary policy is a powerful tool that works to support consumer spending, business investment, and public confidence, it cannot provide a settled rule book for international trade. And this was, once again, Powell in prepared remarks last Friday. Then shortly after those remarks, things took a relatively dramatic turn on Friday, when President Trump said he was ordering U.S. companies doing business in China to explore relocating their operations. This came shortly after Beijing announced new tariffs on U.S. goods. China plans to introduce levies of 5% to 10% on almost all remaining U.S. imports not currently subject to tariffs. Uh, this is going to coincide with what the new U.S. tariffs on China going out. So you have basically back and forth more and more between the U.S. and China on Friday. This could see big big car companies actually such as Ford, Tesla, BMW take some of the biggest hits because they build a ton of cars in the U.S. and then export them to China, mostly on that higher end model as well. Uh, yeah, as, I, as, as we talked about, China is the second largest export market for U.S. made autos, uh, which accounting for roughly 6.2 billion of exports last year. And this is according to statistics published by the U.S. International Trade Administration. And these new tariffs followed Beijing's move to freeze purchases of U.S. agriculture. And as I mentioned, those other uh, tariffs that Trump rolled out starting us that will start on September 1st, and then the other ones that will be pushed back to that mid-December. And then I want to read just a little bit of what Trump said in some tweets just to give people some context of what's going on, because then over the weekend, things kind of became a little less scary in some people's minds. So uh, Trump fired off a series of tweets on Friday saying vast amounts of money, uh, the vast amounts of money made and stolen by China from the United States year after year for decades will and must stop. Our great American companies are hereby ordered to immediately start looking for an alternative to China, including bringing your companies home and making your products in the USA. I will be responding to China's tariffs this afternoon. This is a great opportunity for the United States. Uh, markets went on to tumble the rest of the day. So the Dow Jones closed down more than 600 points or 2.4%. S&P fell 2.6%. The NASDAQ sunk 3%, which ended a relatively quiet week on a, on a pretty crazy note. But then markets actually opened higher this morning. And this came after Trump over the weekend at the G20 summit or G7 summit, excuse me, in France said he was having some second, second thoughts about escalating the trade war with China. There have obviously been various and varying reports of what's actually going to happen next. Trump said that uh, Chinese officials reached out and 
they're going to restart trade negotiations. So it's a little unclear exactly what's going on at the moment, but it seems that with markets bouncing back a little bit Monday morning, there are some hopes that once again, the US and China will eventually reach an agreement. But I don't want to speculate anymore because this trade war has been going on for over a year now, and there's still more uncertainty maybe than ever before of when an end to this eventual trade war uh, or a trade war will eventually occur. So I want to get into more of what I want to talk about today, which is sort of where the markets are going and where some of the bond yields are at now and why we should look at some of these stocks. And I'm going to highlight five stocks today that will maybe help investors uh, get some winnings during this trade war uncertainty. So uh, we know if you're paying attention that Germany and some other places in Europe and Japan are having bonds with negative yields, which basically means that people are paying Germany to hold their money. Uh, and we don't, we're not going to get into all of that. But what I want to talk to exactly is the 10-year U.S. Treasury note, which is one of the safest assets in the world. Those yields are going down. And for just a frame of reference, as prices go up, the yields are going down. So everyone's pouring their money into 10-year U.S. Treasuries. So the yield as of Friday on those was at 1.53. And then it rested around that same spot Monday morning. And we should note that yields hit their lowest level since August 2016 recently, and they rested as high as 3.2% last October and 2.1% as recently as July. And just for that reference, once again, they're sitting at about 1.53% as of this morning. And this gets me to the point of what we're going to talk about today, which is finding some stable companies that have long histories of solid stability growth that also pay a dividend in the sense that there gets to a point where investors in big hedge funds, they have to find some return somewhere. And with bond yields so low, there is this thing called the TINA, the quote unquote so-called TINA effect, or there is no alternative to stocks, which means people are going to try to pile into some high yielding or solid dividend paying stocks that aren't necessarily going to be volatile during this trade war uncertainty in the sense that they run businesses that might not be directly impacted by the trade war. So I want to get into five of these companies we're going to look at today that have massive market caps, stable business models, and as I mentioned, that aren't likely to be negatively impacted a huge amount by just these overall trade war fears. They have solid cash on hand, all of that. So we're going to start with looking at Verizon, which trades under the ticker VZ. And the wireless giant, giant currently holds a market cap of $231 billion, And it is the largest US wireless carrier just inching out its rival AT&T. So it held roughly 35.5% of market share in the US compared to AT&T's 33.4. And then you have T-Mobile and Sprint as those third and fourth players. But we should note that the US Justice Department approved last month the merger of Sprint and T-Mobile. It's not sure that's eventually going to actually be cleared, but it could really create that larger third player that people who are on the side of that merger would say would create a more competitive market for instead of two massive players and then two smaller players to have three more uh, equal players is what you'd see in this wireless market. So we should note then that Verizon topped its quarterly earnings estimates at the start of August. It also added uh, more phone net additions than it did in the year ago period. Those topped analyst expectations. And we should also note that Verizon has slowly pushed out its 5G services to more cities throughout the country as it prepares along with rivals like AT&T to offer that next generation of wireless communications throughout the country. Uh, VZ, VZ shares are up 16% over the last two years which easily tops the wireless industry's 1.5% average climb. 
Looking ahead, our Zach's consensus estimates are calling for Verizon's full year revenue to pop just around uh, half half a percent to over 31, 131 billion, while its earnings are projected to climb roughly 2%. And then looking farther down the road to fiscal 2020, its revenues are expected to climb over 1% above our current year estimate with its earnings per share expected to come in nearly 2% higher as well. So some stability of growth there in both the top and bottom lines for the next couple of years. And then at the moment, we should note that its earnings estimate revisions have been trending in the right direction. So it's currently a Zach's rank number two buy. And then why it's a stock I think people should take a look at. It also uh, sports an A grade for value and momentum and a B grade for growth in our style score system. And it's currently paying an annualized dividend of $2.41 per share with an impressive yield of 4.24%. So well above the 10-year U.S. Treasury's 1.5% at the moment with some added exposure to growth. And we should note that this dividend yield isn't somehow artificially inflated by the stock going down crazy over the last several years or anything like that. Because we already mentioned that Verizon shares are up 16% over the last two years compared to its industry's 1.5% climb. So that's why Verizon looks so strong. And then another big name company that operates a totally different business model is Coca-Cola, which trades under the ticker KO. It topped estimates last quarter and also raised its full year organic revenue forecast. We should note that the company's uh, Coca-Cola Zero Sugar posted its seventh consecutive quarter of double digit volume growth globally. It also rolled out its first ever Costa coffee ready to drink product in Great Britain. And we should note that for any of you who didn't listen to our big uh, coffee podcast a couple weeks ago on this show, that Coca Cola purchased the British coffee chain Costa for around $5 billion earlier this year as part of its plan to expand beyond that sugary drink, soda, pop market, whatever you want to call it. This also includes investments in an upstart Gatorade rival known as Body Armor. And they also introduced recently the first ever Coke branded energy drink. And they're doing a lot of other, just as I said, trying to expand beyond this soft drink soda market. So KO's organic revenue which excludes currency swings, acquisitions, and divestitures, jumped 6% in the second quarter of 2019. And the firm now expects its full-year organic revenues to climb roughly 5%. And then we should note that our current estimates for overall top-line growth are expected to see 16% growth, but this includes acquisitions and divestitures. So it's a little bit inflated from what the actual business uh, that Coke is talking about its organic business is going to do, but still some some solid growth, and we'll see that that next year we're calling for roughly five percent growth on top of that. So that's that stabilized number that's including some of these new purchases and divestitures. And then on the bottom line, Coke's adjusted fiscal 2019 earnings are expected to climb roughly one percent, and then 2020 is expected to come in eight percent above that. And then at the moment. Uh, Coca-Cola pays an annualized dividend of $1.60 per share with a yield of just under 3%, so a really solid yield there as well. It's also currently a Zach's rank number two buy and has a B grade for growth in our style score system. And then just with, again, with Verizon, because sometimes dividend yields can sound really impressive, but the yield could have just gone up so much because the stock price has gone down so much recently. So over the last year, Coca-Cola stock is up 18%, which outpaces the S&P 500. It's pretty much sideways movement at this point. So some solid growth for Coca-Cola while still having that strong earnings yield is another company to certainly take a look at uh, amid this trade war uncertainty in the market. And then another company operating a completely different business model is Microsoft, which trades under the ticker M. SFT. Its shares have easily outpaced its industry's average in 2019, up 33%. And this climb has helped the company once again become the world's most valuable publicly traded company with a market cap of over $1 trillion. 
the historic tech powerhouse is really been on an impressive run over the last five years. Its expansion into cloud computing has attracted more investors. Last quarter, that intelligent cloud division jumped 19%, and its Amazon AWS competitor, Azuru, uh, was up 64%. And meanwhile, Microsoft Office and Windows and its gaming and some other segments have also expanded at impressive clips. So it's really been a company that has actually out started to outpace all those so-called FANG stocks of Facebook, Alphabet, Netflix, Amazon. Uh, I think I, I think I just named them all. Uh, the FANG stocks, the big the big five tech stocks that have really driven growth on the S and P five hundred for so long. Microsoft over the last year has really stood out in an impressive way compared to that. So on top of that, the company currently pays an annualized dividend of $1.84 per share, which is up roughly 10% from the year ago period's quarterly payout on an annualized basis. And so despite its impressive climb on, uh, which is up 134% over the last three years, this is against the S&P 500's 34%, its yield rests at roughly 1.4% right now. So a little bit below the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, but you also are exposed to the big potential for growth on the Microsoft end as it's as it really has been able to drive uh, into new industries, as we mentioned, from cloud computing to it's now going to start rolling out a cloud gaming unit and Office and its other segments have continued to expand as well. And we're calling currently for Microsoft's fiscal 2020 and 2021. So it's currently in its fiscal 2020 year right now. Those revenues are both expected to jump roughly 11%. So 11% this year and an additional 11% in the next year. So some really solid top line growth for such a big company that's been around for a really long time. And then on the bottom end, we're calling for an additional for 10% earnings growth this year. And then 13% higher growth that next year. So some really impressive growth statistics or projections for Microsoft over the next couple years. And it's currently a Zach's rank number two buy as well. And now we're going to move on to Comcast, which trades under the ticker CMCSA. Comcast stock, another solid stock in 2019. It's up 23% over the last 12 months and 28% in 2019 alone. And the communications and entertainment giants internet business has really been able to help offset some of its losses from that wider cord cutting dilemma that's facing the entire industry. And it is worth noting that people are worried about this cord cutting thing for all of these big cable providers. But in order to have Netflix and Disney Plus and Amazon Prime and Apple's new service, you still need a really solid internet connection and internet costs are going up as well. So in the second quarter, high-speed internet revenue jumped 9.4% for Comcast while business services sales climbed nearly 10%. And the company also added uh, 21% more uh, wireless customer, so it's rolling out a new wireless business. It launched in 2007, and it hopes to eventually compete with the likes of Verizon and AT and T as it looks to offset once again its its lack of cable growth going forward. And we should note that Comcast Sky acquisition is set to help the firm expand, and it also plans to launch a streaming service through its NBC Universal brand. With that expected to launch in April of 2020, that's going to be home to The Office and a lot more content, and that hopes to compete alongside Netflix and Amazon Prime and, all, as I said, all these other streaming services. So the company's full-year revenue this year is expected to jump nearly 17%, but this is with some sky-boosted numbers. So peaking a little bit further ahead to 2020, revenues are expected to climb 5% above this sky-boosted 2019 results. And then on the bottom end, the company's earnings are expected to climb 20% this year, and then another 10% above that in the following fiscal year. So impressive growth estimates there for Comcast. Like its other peers so far in this list, it's also currently a Zach's rank number two buy 
and it boasts an A grade for value. And it currently pays a quarterly dividend of 21 cents per share, which is up from uh, 19 cents on its last payout. And it currently has a yield of 1.9%. So that is coming well above the 10-year U.S. Treasuries 1.53 at the moment. And then we're going to end with a company that pretty much everyone around the entire world has heard of, and that is McDonald's. That trades under the ticker MCD, and its shares have soared over 37% in the last 52 weeks, are up 10% in the last three months. Its stock has destroyed the S&P 500 during a three-year stretch, up 91% against the S&P 500. It's 32% expansion. And in the second quarter, the global fast food powerhouse same store sales were up 6.5%, which is a really impressive clip. Uh, And U.S. comps were up 5.7%. Management noted that higher prices led to some of that comps growth. And along with that, it noted that its delivery offerings and self-ordering kiosks helped boost some sales as well. And along with that delivery push, we should note that in mid-July, McDonald's added DoorDash as a delivery partner, which effectively ended it. It ended its exclusive relationship with Uber Eats, which is owned by Uber, we should note. So McDonald's, like everyone else, has really tried to roll out its delivery business uh, in the Amazon age. This includes rivals like Starbucks, and everyone else is jumping into the same thing as well. Uh, McDonald's also expects to open roughly 1,200 stores this year, and they're trying to also slowly remodel and digitalize a lot of their offerings or their stores with these kiosks. They're encouraging their franchisees to do the same. So looking ahead, uh, our estimates are calling for the company's fiscal 2019 earnings to climb roughly 1.4% and then come in nearly 10% above that next year, which is a really impressive growth number. And then currently McDonald's is a Zach's rank number two buy. It pays an annualized dividend of $4.64 per share. And that's up roughly 11% from its previous year payout. And the company's dividend yield currently rests at 2.12%. So once again, well above that 10-year U.S. Treasury. So we've we've talked about five stocks that operate really impressive businesses that aren't likely to be impacted in a very significant way, no matter really where this trade war heads. But we never know what's going on with the trade war. So with yield so low as everyone dives into the safe haven asset that is the 10-year U.S. Treasury, it's good to try to look for a stock that is paying a dividend with a relatively solid yield that's also trending in the right direction. So don't just look for it's paying a 10% yield, but the stock is tanked 45% in the last year or something like that, because that's just artificially inflated. So that does it for another episode of Full Court Finance. Until next time, I'm your host, Ben Rains. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.